our person that is going to welcome us. Aha. All right. So welcome everybody. Like this is our, our I think it's our twelfth twelfth meetup. It's like this is by far I think our largest attendance. So kudos to everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, yay. Uh, so logistics about this one. Bathrooms are over there. Uh, we're going to have two minis, and, and this is the last month that we have minis because apparently it's brutal to squeeze a paper in five minutes, but I didn't realize that at the beginning, so I'm so sorry to our, our mini speakers. Uh, I apologize. Uh, as of the next meetup, we're going to have one mini that may be around 10 minutes, and that probably will be more humane for everybody involved. So. If you want to do a mini, a mini uh, we, have, uh, we have them booked until April, but from April on, they're free. So they're, they're free for the taking. So I know a few of you that are regulars, uh, so expect me to come and ask you when you're speaking. But um, other than that, uh, we're going to get started. Uh, thank you for it. Thank you to Yammer for hosting us and for the food. Clappy. Yes. Yes. And, and they're going to have a, a message, and then we're going to get started with docs. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm John. Um, welcome to Yammer. Uh, make yourselves at home. Uh, like every other company in Silicon Valley, we're hiring. So um, we're trying to make a slightly better social network uh, so people can enjoy themselves and communicate better at work. So if you're interested in helping us build that, uh, come see myself or Clark or someone else at Yammer, and we'll give you more details. And other than that, enjoy yourselves. All right, so we're going to give it up for Gareth, and he's going to talk about the rendering equation, and he will have some time for questions. Then Veronica is going to give another mini, and then we're going to make maybe a three-minute interruption for people to get more drinks, and then Katie's going to do her talk. So hopefully, like, you have a good time and return next month. Bye, guys. Is this on? Yep. No, hi. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Gareth Morgan. And tonight, I'm going to be giving a brief taster of my upcoming uh, Papers We Love talk on what I think is one of the most important uh, papers in the history of 3D graphics. That is uh, uh, James Kajia's 1986 SIGGRAPH paper entitled The Rendering Equation. So I'm going to jump straight in and uh, show you the equation in all its glory. Here it is. Uh, before I try and explain what the equation itself is all about, I'm going to spend a few minutes just explaining why I think it is so important. If you look on the left-hand side of the equation, you'll see this term i. Uh, so to, to start to explain why the rendering equation is so important, we'll start with this term i. What does i actually mean? Uh, in the paper, uh, James Kajia describes i as the measurement of the energy of radiation passing from one point, x prime, to another point, x. Uh, in this context, radiation means light. So what I give you is a measure of the light energy that passes from some point in the world, x prime, to another point in the world, x. Why does this matter? Well, uh, hopefully it will make it a bit clearer why this is important. If we replace x, and instead of it being some arbitrary point in the world, we say x is your i. So now we have an equation that gives you the uh, amount of energy from any point, any arbitrary point in the world, amount of light energy that reaches your eye from that point. This basically is what 3D graphics is all about. Anytime you see a computer generated image, uh, whether it's a really early computer game like this Doom, all the way through to a, a modern sophisticated computer game like Call of Duty, or a modern uh, uh, production graphics like an animated film like Frozen, all these images, all these images are attempts to solve the rendering equation. They're merely saying how much light will reach our eye, how much light energy for these given points in the, in the world, how much light will reach our eye. This is why the rendering equation is so important. By formulating in this way and by uh, proposing a means that we can actually solve it mathematically using modern computers, uh, James Kajira really revolutionized the field of 3D graphics. OK, so back to the rendering equation itself. Um, I'm just, I don't know very long now, so I'm just going to uh, briefly go over uh, the different terms that make up uh, the rendering equation. Uh, the first term is this geometry term, g. Uh, the most important aspect of g is that it's zero. If, there's a, if there is geometry between our point x and our point x prime that is opaque, then g is zero. Otherwise, g is non-zero. And because g is multiplied by the rest of the expression, the whole rendering equation is zero. So if there is an opaque object between point x 
and point x prime, then the whole rendering equation is zero. From a common, common sense point of view, this makes sense. If there's an opaque object between our eye and the point, where, the point x, then obviously no light is going to reach our eye from the point x. Uh, the next term is the emittance term. If the object that x prime is part of is actually a light in itself that's emitting photons into the world, then uh, the most of the light that reaches our eye from that point is going to be those photons that are emitted by the light. Uh, and that's what the emittance term is all about. Of course, for most objects in the scene, they don't emit light in and of themselves. They, most objects in the scene aren't lights, so the emittance term will be zero. For those objects, the most important part of the rendering equation is the integral. Uh, for objects that don't emit light for themselves, they get their light from all the other surfaces in the world. So you have to integrate over all the other surfaces in the world in order to come up with how much light ultimately reaches our eye from this point x prime. Within the integral, you now have, we now have three points. We have our original point x, we have the point we're trying to solve i for, which is x prime, and we now have a third point, which is some arbitrary point in the world, x double prime. The two terms in the integral itself. The first is a scattering term. Not all the light that arrives at point x prime from the point x double prime ultimately ends up at point x. That's what the scattering, the scattering term is attempting to show. Uh, the way it does this by, is by using, it's, it's expressed in terms of what's called a bidirectional reflection, reflectance distribution function, or BRDF. I don't have really time to go into this in this talk, but this is an incredibly, incredibly important concept in computer graphics, um, and it's extremely important when it comes to accurately representing how uh, real-life materials behave mathematically. Um, it's called a BRDF. But I don't have time to go into it now. And then finally, you have I again. The rendering equation itself is recursive. In order to work out how much light travels from point x prime to point x, we need to know how much light travels from point x double prime to x prime. So uh, lastly, I'll just quickly uh, uh, touch on how we actually go about solving it. Uh, the way James Kajia proposed solving uh, this integral is uh, by using numerical integration. So rather by traditional symbolic integration, Numerical integration involves using the brute force power of computers to estimate the value of the integral. So in this example, we have this teapot that is sitting next to a green floor and a red wall. Uh, the teapot itself is not a light. And we've chosen a point x prime sitting on the surface of the, of the teapot. And we want to solve the rendering equation to tell us how much light will reach our eye from this, at, at point x from this point x prime. As the teapot is not a light, we know all the light that ultimately reaches our eye from the point x prime comes from all the other surfaces in the, in the scene. It doesn't come originally from the teapot itself. So in order to solve the integral at x prime, we have to, choo we have to, uh, we have to, uh, we have to choose sample points that make up the entire world. So we have to randomly choose a point uh, and call it x double prime. And then we rerun the rendering equation recursively to show us how much light will arrive at point x prime from point x double prime and as we, cut, as we choose more and more points, our estimate for the, uh, for the value of the rendering equation will get more and more accurate. Uh, for the render, for the, to come up with the perfectly correct answer, we'd have to choose an infinite number of points. But uh, you can actually, in practice, come up with a pretty good answer using a pretty small number of points. That basically is the rendering equation and how you go about solving it. Obviously, there's far, far more to it than that. Uh, if you want to know more, uh, come see my full talk later this year. Also, get the paper, like read the paper. It's a really good paper, that's why I'm here. It's freely available online, uh, you should read it if you have any interest in 3D graphics at all. Uh, and finally, I have a blog, 3D Nerds with a U, at Blogspot, and I have a chapter in the upcoming GPU Pro book, GPU Pro 6, you should buy it, it's out in April. My chapter is Hybrid Ray Tracing on a PowerVR GPU. Thank you. I think I, think I have time for a couple of questions. Anyone has a question? My question basically centered around um, in cases like in real time environments where computing the full thing is impractical, in later work, are 
simplifying assumptions written in terms of the rendering equation, or do they specify it sort of in a different way? Um, for, for most of Archie, so, so for mo most of, 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 of real-time computer graphic, you're quite right. Nobody, nobody really cared that much about the rendering equation. It was a thing you did in production graphics. So actually, most computer games, actually, no, most, like, um, I don't know if you've heard of, like, physical shading. That's now the kind of hot buzzword in computer games. Most of that is based on the rendering equation. So, yeah, so more and more nowadays in modern games, like the Call of Duty I showed, for example, you will actually have, uh, you'll have, obviously, they're very, very fast approximations of the rendering equation, but they are actually attempts to solve the rendering equation in real time. Cool. Thanks. Um, you said it is uh, normally solved uh, using brute force method instead of the numerical methods. Is there any specific reason? Is the numerical method slow? Would I was assume that uh, mathematical software would be faster than a brute force one? Uh, so I mean, uh, so, the, 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 so the, the method proposed by uh, Jim, James Kachia is the brute force. It's called unbiased rendering. So it is literally you choose random points, and each you know each, each recurse point of the recursion you choose more random points. Obviously, yeah, there is. In the, again, it's one of those things, well, in the real world, of course, you know ahead of time which are the important points, and you can choose them in a non-brute non force way, and actually that's what most of the, obviously, there's been, there's been 30 years of research on the subject, and then many of the advancements uh, to the, to, on top of that since then have been in the subject of actually non, so biased renders, they're called in the, in the, in the industry, so rather than unbiased renders, which is a purely brute force approach, so yeah. Does the rendering equation as introduced by Kajia account for uh, scattering, differences of scattering in different wavelengths of light? Does it have a wavelength dependence? Uh, no, so yeah, that's actually a point, I, I, a very important point that I didn't really have time to say, that of course, all these terms are 3D RGB values. Um, there is no, yeah, there's no, there, there, is, the, there are, the, not, 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 not as it was written by Kajia, no. There was no, there was no wavelength dependence. People have, obviously, for some, Usually, wavelength is ignored in computer graphic, but there, except for a few, there's a few, ter, there's a few effects where you need to know where you actually have to care about the wavelengths of light, and um, yeah. So, no, so at the time, no, but in the meantime, yeah, plenty, there have been plenty of papers that followed up that have, have aligned. Uh, I think you mentioned when you were first describing I that in this, you said it was to describe the radiation that was transferred between the points, and in this case, it would be light energy. Are there other applications of the rendering equation or of that set up for like non light um, energy? Or I, other I'm, sure there are, yeah, I'm sure there are people that do, you know, nuclear, <laughs> nuclear weapons research and such that probably use the same equation. And that use the same with, yeah. yeah, that actually talk about ionizing radiation because it's, yeah, it's not actually physically, in a physics sense, there's no difference between ionizing radiation and and, uh, and light, light energy, so I'm sure there are people that use the same equation for ionizing radiation. I've not read one myself, but... Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, I rescheduled him like four times, poor guy, so he's been <laughs> waiting to tell us this. So thank you so much. All right, Veronica. Let's see. Hey, can everyone hear me? Hello? Okay, great. Uh, hey, everyone. My name's Veronica. I'm a software engineer at LinkedIn, and I'm going to talk to you about a paper out of Google Chrome from 2014 called Experimenting at Scale with Google Chrome's SSL Warning. Uh, so I love this paper because it's about something that we all have encountered before, those browser security warnings. And um, I know I don't always go back to safety. And uh, researchers at Chrome were concerned because uh, the click-through rates on these warnings is 70%, which is very high. So that's 70% of people click through and don't go back to safety. They go to the untrusted website. Uh, compared to Mozilla Firefox, which has a 33% click-through rate. So what is click-through rate? 
So a click-through rate is clicks over impressions times 100. So this is indicates how often users uh, click through, so they go to this untrusted website. For online advertising, which is where this term is very common, you want click-through rates to be high. You want people clicking on your ads. But for browser security uh, warnings, it should be low. So what is SSL? So SSL stands for Secure Sockets Layer. Uh, it's a protocol for encrypting information over the internet. It allows you to transmit private data online, like your credit card number and your social security number. So uh, why are these researchers at Google so concerned about people clicking through the browser security warnings? Well, um, as a web user, uh, we all rely on SSL for privacy and security, for credit cards, social security numbers, any other data um, you have online. Uh, for journalists and dissidents, um, the danger is much more immediate when it comes to their own physical safety. Um, so one thing about these warnings is that it's often difficult or impossible as a user to differentiate between just a server misconfiguration and an actual attack where your personal data you know, might be in someone else's hands. And in general, uh, low click-through rates were encouraged developers to adopt valid SSL certificates. So one thing I wondered about when I read this paper is, OK, so what's the big deal? Like, um, what actually happens to people who click through these warnings? So I tweeted at one of the co-authors of the paper, um, asking her this question. So unfortunately, there's no public work about what actually happens to people who click through warnings. Like, what's the percentage you know, of times where someone actually gets attacked? But it's an awesome area of research if anyone wants to study it. <laughs> So this paper uh, was really um, revolutionary because it's the first one that actually looks at what real users do, not just what people in a lab do. And it focused specifically on design, so the design of the warnings. So I have some warnings here. Um, so the top left is the default Chrome SSL warning, which I'm sure many of you have seen before. And, and the bottom left is the mock Firefox SSL warning. So basically, it just uh, changes it to say Chrome instead of Firefox and removes uh, an extra step, which was tested separately. And then on the top right is um, the Firefox SSL warning with you know, the, the name change to Chrome and also Google corporate styling. So these were the various. Um, uh, hypotheses that were tested. So um, the methodology, as I said, was on real users, um, which was really awesome. And the conclusions were very surprising to me. So it turns out that visual appearance of the warning accounts be for between a third and a half of the difference in click-through rates between Chrome and Firefox. So what did it matter? A very simple extra step that you had to do in order to click through the warning, uh, following Google corporate style guidelines, and also human images of a policeman or a criminal which is supposed to you know, scare you or trigger some type of you know, social uh, feelings. But what did matter? So it turns out uh, the text, layout, and, and or the default button choice make the warning more effective. And uh, once in what's interesting is the Firefox warning appears to follow guidelines from prior work. And so uh, what the researchers at Chrome saw is that prior work shows that avoiding technical jargon, identifying ways to mitigate the risk under what should I do, and hiding technical details by default, and having a clear default choice, all have been shown um, to help um, you know, users not click through these warnings. So, if there's one thing you remember from my talk tonight, it's that uh, as programmers, we like to think we are very safe and rational. But it turns out visual design makes a significant impact on the actual choices users make about their security. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay.
other than uh, large volume kind of like multivariate testing, how would you figure this out in, in the absence of volume? Uh, figure out like what warnings are effective and what aren't? Yeah, I mean, maybe not just warnings, but like what, you know, when you talk about the visual design makes an impact, like how do you test that in the absence of, of large volume, like Chrome what obviously has? Yeah, I, so the previous work had all been done in, in labs. Um, and uh, according to, you know, these authors, uh, people behaved unnaturally in like lab settings and having people like, you know, go online and kind of show warnings and see what they do in a lab. So that isn't ideal, but um, I mean, that's something you can, that's what, that's what the prior work has done in absence of the volume that Chrome has. Do you have any idea of any other research done by any other browsers, say Internet Explorer or Firefox or something like that? Uh, other research done on... Other browsers? Other browsers? No, I, I've seen other research um, out, of, out of Chrome. Um, they had, they, they've done research about if people seen warnings before, um, but no, I haven't seen it with any other browsers. All right, so we have like maybe three minutes. So if you need more drinks uh, or if you need to use the restroom uh, while Katie sits up, now is your time. I actually don't really need notes, but I always forget how to do this. The double display notes, fuck it. We're going without notes. Uh, do, you, do you even do the, you mean so you can have your notes? Yeah. So you do the, like, uh, in the, this, in the view maybe, and then you just like do preview, edit, no, no, no. Uh, maybe play, and then there should be something that is like uh, rehearse slideshow, and then you are able to, in here, yeah. like in this oh, yeah. and then you said presenter notes. It's like now then you just do, you can, actually you have to like click the mirroring. Yeah. And so then, you have the muted. Yeah, that's what I was trying to find, the mirror. Yeah, so you had it on displays. The system. Actually, it should be displaying. Yeah, in displays. Okay. And, and then, then you had it in arrangement. Show mirror options and menu bar when available. No, no, oh, arrangement. And then you do, instead of mirror, you unclick it. That's right. Yeah. Thank Good. you. I like did not figure this out. I haven't set up on this laptop because like my other ones like. No, 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 no worries. And then I think like now when you put the the, the, the play, yeah, you should have yeah. your notes. Wait, you have to do it again. That's no, I'm good. Are you sure? Because your speaker oh. wants me not be showing. Yeah, see. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. There's a fucking lot of people here. You 
were incredibly drunk. Just here's my phone. <laughs> Is this on? Okay. Inez says, come sit down. <laughs> We're going to get started. What? <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get it. <laughs> Why is this Mardi Gras related? Or it's not? Oh. Oh, I didn't even get that. Oh. oh. That was a great joke, boys. High five. <laughs> okay. We're going to get started. All right. Uh, hey, guys. Uh, thanks for coming out. We're going to talk about the Orleans paper tonight. Um, yeah. So um, I'm Katie McCaffrey. Um, I'm a distributed systems engineer. All of the information about me on the meetup is actually wrong because there have been a lot of life happening in the last six months since when this got scheduled. I actually live here now, which is awesome. Uh, and I work at the Twitters. Um, and that's my Twitter and my blog if you want to like talk to me on the internet. That's cool. I totally do that. Um, but anyway, I'm here to talk to you about Orleans Distributed Virtual Actors for programmability and scalability. And this is a paper that came out of Microsoft Research from the Extreme Computing Group. Um, these guys are really awesome. Um, it's also, I have a really interesting perspective on it because I spent the last five to six years working in the entertainment industry and most of it spent working with this guy who is the Master Chief. He's the main character in the Halo video game which comes from, um, which is an Xbox game. For those of you who are not gamers. Um, and basically, when we took over the Halo franchise from the owning, uh, the originating studio Bungie, a studio inside of Microsoft was formed called 343 Industries, which is what I worked at. Um, we decided to rebuild the services because they were about 10 years old and they were built on top of, they had a lot of problems um, that I'm not going to get into here because that's not what we're here to talk about. Um, but we basically partnered with this MSR team um, for the Orleans team and we took their, their concept of Orleans and then we productionized it and we shipped the entire Halo 4 stack based on top of this. So this was like actually a re really nice partnership between um, research and industry coming together and like shipping something real. Uh, there are actually multiple Orleans papers, which is confusing sometimes. There was the one, first one came out in uh, November 30th, 2010 and that was my first exposure to it. Um, and then there was uh, another one published subsequently in October 2011. And then um, and somewhere in June of 2011 is when we started working with them. And then the one I'm going to be talking about is the most recent one. This is like what actually Orleans has evolved to be over the years, what we shipped Halo 4 on and what is now open sourced on GitHub. Um, so there are some things from the earlier papers that did not make it into the later papers. Um, I don't See you, Saren. I see Alexis here. What's up? Yeah, I got you. We can talk about this later at the bar because um, I'm not going to go into some of the differences because um, there's just like too many things there. But essentially, I'm going to talk to you about what actually exists. Okay. So Orleans is based on top of the actor model. So I think most of you are probably familiar with it, but we're going to do a quick rundown on what that is. Um, the actor model came out of a 1973 paper by Hewitt, Bishop, and Steiger. Um, this was actually used to solve some artificial intelligence problems. But basically, the actor model is a framework for reasoning 
um, about concurrency and doing concurrent computations because turns out that's hard. Oh, am I not close enough? Better? Yeah. Better? Okay. Okay, so the actor model is a reasoning, uh, a framework and basis for reasoning about concurrency because concurrent programming is hard. So it tries to do some things to make it a little easier on us. Um, basically, the core concepts are actors or primitives for reasoning about concurrent, for doing concurrent computation. Um, and they can only communicate with one another via asynchronous message pass passing. So they're isolated, they can't screw with each other's state, makes life better when you have a lot of concurrent operations going on. Uh, when an actor gets one of these asynchronous messages, it can do a couple things. It can send another message, it can create new actors, or it can designate a behavior to be used on the next message, which is, essentially means it's modifying its internal state. Um, and so, right, they can have their own state which they can persist um, and do things with and then like uh, be like little state machines. So that's sort of sort of basics of, of the actor model. Okay, Orleans is a runtime and programming model for building distributed systems based on the actor model. Um, in Orleans, some jargon, just so you understand what's going on, is an actor is sometimes called a grain. I will use the terms, terms interchangeably. I think in the paper they almost solely use actor, but it's been hardwired into my brain for the last five years, that's a grain. Um, actors are also uniquely identified by a type and a unique ID. Um, and an instance of a, an actor or a grain in Orleans is called, it will be referred to as an activation. So that's like something that's in memory and running. The bread and butter of Orleans is this concept of virtual actors. So this is sort of the biggest contribution for the paper in the space. Um, so basically it's this idea of an Orleans, an actor always exists virtually. It cannot be explicitly created or destroyed. It may be in memory running on your cluster or it may not be in memory. Um, and Orleans, because of this abstraction, Orleans is allowed to do a lot of things to help you with distributed systems problems. Um, okay, so to understand virtual actors, there's a couple of key things you need to get. Um, virtual actors are perpetually exist, right? They're logical entities, they always exist, whether they have been, uh, once they're, you cannot physically create them, you cannot physically destroy them, they are just things that exist in this Orleans universe. Um, because of this, you, the Orleans framework gives you automatic instantiation. So um, basically whenever an actor is needed, aka a message is passed to it, um, Orleans will go and make sure that that actor ex actually exists on a machine somewhere in your cluster and hydrate it and bring it into memory if it doesn't already exist. Um, consequently, or like conversely, um, actors are also garbage collected on the fly. Um, so basically when an actor is not being talked to, it will be deallocated by the Orleans runtime you as a developer are not managing any of this lifecycle yourself. I do want to point out that this garbage collection is not some crazy distributed garbage collector. Um, it's literally just like, I haven't talked to this actor for a configurable amount of time, please kill it and free up the resource. Um, this is able to be done because of the whole concept of virtual actors, which I will continue to explain a bit later, but they're not doing anything super, super challenging with distributed garbage collectors. Uh, the other key concept is location transparency. Uh, you have no idea where this grain is running in your system, and that's totally fine. It could be on one machine the first time you send a message to it, it could be on another machine the next time you send a message to it, it could not be in memory at all on any of your machines, um, and Orleans will have to hydrate it. This is basically sort of like um, when you send me a text message on my cell phone, you don't know where in the world I am at, you just know my identifier, you know my phone number, right? And so I could be here, I could be in Seattle, I could be in London, um, which I will be in two weeks. Um, and the cell towers will just rent, will just uh, route it for you. It has no, there's no like good real concept of like not existing at all. Maybe I'm having an existential crisis and the cell towers still route it to me, but whatever. Um, so it's that, it's that idea, right? Like you don't know where it's happening. You just say like send this message to this person. And then because of virtual actors, you basically get automatic scale out. So the placement of um, actors slash grains is not deterministic, right? It actually changes over time. And because of this, if you just add another machine to your cluster, um, Orleans can immediately start using it, which is great. You don't have to like redeploy and you don't have to like change topologies. It just will like start using that new machine automatically. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how it does this using its runtime. Um, so basically when you go and deploy Orleans, you have a cluster of servers in your data center and each thing is, each machine is called a silo. And each silo has a container process, which is the Orleans runtime. And then it's also um, running and hosting your actor code and running that for you. 
and it has three main components. There's the messaging system, the hosting system, and the execution system. The messaging system connects each pair of servers in, um, in the cluster with a persistent TCP connection, and it manages this connection for you. Um, it handles message serialization as well. Uh, the Orleans team actually wrote their own serializer, because, which is on par performance with um, something like protobufs for native types, but it also supports things like dictionaries and collections and maps and complex types that, you know, as a developer I can use the types I'm used to and it just, it's very performant. They like optimized it a lot. It is not bad like .NET serializable is. Um, uh, so basically the messaging system will serialize these things out over the wire and read things over the wire and, and do that. And this helps provide some isolation which I'll talk about later. Uh, the hosting system does all the virtual actorness. It decides where to place these activations and manages their life cycles. Um, it decides if an actor is idle, it's going to go garbage collect it. Um, and this is the thing that manages the distributed hash table that uh, knows where all of the grains live. So the distributed hash table is interesting because it implies that you have an extra network hop to do anything. Like you have to go look it up in this distributed hash table where this thing lives and then you have to go and like route that message. In practice, an Orleans reference is 80 bytes. Um, and Orleans makes aggressive use of caching to basically ensure that we had in practice a 90% hit rate of cache. So we almost never actually paid this penalty for the extra hop. It's also worth noting that this distributed hash table does nothing with consensus. Um, so you can always activate a grain. Um, and you can always route a message to a grain. And I will talk about some of the, the consequences of that later. Um, but this is like the choice, right? Like Orleans chose availability. And um, I think that was a great decision, especially for our use cases. Um, the final system is the execution system. Oops, sorry. Um, the final system is the execution system, and so this is the bit that's basically running your grain code. Um, it's enforcing single threaded execution inside of code inside of a grain. Um, and so Orleans has their own thread pool that they manage. There's essentially one thread per core on the machine because that's the most performant um, stuff they found with testing that they describe of it in the paper. Um, and so the single threaded guarantee is basically when I am processing code in a grain as a developer, I don't have to worry about interleaving. I don't have to worry about locks or CAS operations. I just write code like it's executing um, on a single thread because it is. There is a way to get around that called the reentrant tag. If you know what you're doing and are pulling an advanced maneuver, you can 100% do this, and we did, but it's also an advanced maneuver. So, you know, maybe just start with the single threadedness and optimize when necessary. Um, so. Cool, so that's the runtime. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the programming model. Orleans is .NET. I know, sad, Silicon Valley, sad, super sad. Um, but I have good news for you. Um, so it's C Sharp, F Sharp, Windows. Um, the .NET Core is this project that's coming out of sight of Microsoft where they are developing .NET open source on GitHub. Um, and it will compile down to Mac um, OS and Linux. And so the goal is eventually Orleans will also be .NET Core compatible. And so in theory, you can then go write your code in C-sharp, which is a beautiful language. I want to point that out. Um, uh, and then it will compile down and run on your Linux machines. And they're, they're actually making a really diligent job of making this incredibly performant. So hopefully future things, you can run this on not Windows. Um, so the way you do this is um, to specify what kind of actors you would like in your system, you uh, specify a .NET interfaces. And so these interfaces define the methods and properties on this actor that you would like to expose as messages that people can then interact with it. Um, everything is strongly typed. Um, everything is also asynchronous, right? We want these async messages, and Orleans actually enforces this at compile time by ensuring that all your methods have um, asynchronous uh, you know, method descriptions. Um, so something it looks basically kind of like this. This is a really dumb example, but you have, um, you have a grain, it inherits from the base interface, you define like two message types, I have no parameters in here, but you could 100% define parameters in that method, and then these are the things that you can send to your, uh, these are the types of messages that this grain can interact with. Um, also, if you are not familiar with C-sharp, task is basically our promise slash future library. Okay. Uh, the other important concept to know when programming in Orleans is you have this thing called an actor reference. These are strongly typed virtual actor proxies. 
Um, basically, these allow other actors as well as non-actor code to send messages to actors in Orleans. Um, they're virtual, right? So there is actually nothing in there that tells you the location of where this thing lives. It's just enough information for the Orleans runtime to go and look up where this thing lives. Um, so right, this is like essentially the 80 bytes of code that is stored in the cache. Um, and so you basically go and uh, the actor references implement the interface. Um, you get this nice factory method generated for you by code gen at compile time. You pass in the ID of the actor you would like to talk to. And then you get this, this I hello friend. This is an actor reference. Um, this is, contains nothing about where it lives. It's not the actual type. Um, but it does uh, code gen the interface so that what's actually happening under the hood is Orleans is going then and saying when you say say hello, um, it'll go and copy all of the parameters that may be passing that method. In this one, there are none. Um, and then it's going to go kick off a message to that grain somewhere in the Orleans system. And then eventually, um, that message will return because it has a promise attached to it. And then you can do whatever you want with it. You can like send it out over the wire on an HTTP request. You can use it to do more computation inside of an actor. Um, whatever. Once again, the await thing is neither nice, beautiful C sharp .NET 4.5 asynchronous programming language thing where um, it's magically wrapping, the compiler is magically wrapping everything after it in a closure. Um, so async programming looks like synchronous if you're not familiar with what's happening there. It's essentially like doing a dot continuous. Um, cool, so that's virtual actor proxies. And then the last bit to understand is that um, work executes inside of a grain single-threadedly in something called a turn. Uh, Orleans will do it execute its entire code path until it does an async operation and then it gives up its turn and then like the scheduler takes over. Um, but because there are multiple threads running, you don't run into this problem where like one dumb piece of code that loops forever can block all execution on the box. Um, there's also the concept of persistence and this is where this current implementation differs from the, the other Orleans papers the most. It's up to you as a developer to do persistence because turns out that shit's hard. Um, <laughs> It's hard to do in the general case, right? And so what they decided to do is it's just like let you know your application best, you decide how you want to persist code. You, or persist green state between activations. You may not want to persist state at all. You may want to persist on every message received or you may want to persist on a timer or a reminder. Um, and we did all three in Halo, right? So this is sort of what it looks like to implement a grain. Um, you know, you implement, inherit from the base class, you implement the interface, I implement my two methods, right? Um, I'm not actually doing asynchronous work in any of these, but I have to return a promise. Um, and then also my counts are grain state. This is not gonna be persisted between activations, so I'm basically saying I don't care if I persist this between activations by writing code like this. If I do care, I need to persist that to your favorite uh, storage method of choice. And then uh, what is not shown here is that on a uh, there's a method supplied to you that you can override called activate async where you can rehydrate grain state um, from your durable storage. Or you could like in theory do it lazily if you wanted, once again, up to you as a developer based on your application needs. I also don't recommend doing a lot of things in activate async because that gets called when the grain is in, like brought up and hydrated into memory and so you don't want it doing a lot because you will start noticing when activations are happening and that's generally bad. Okay, so all of this is super nice. The programming model is great. Not having to manage um, actor life cycles is a big win in my opinion, um, like you do in ACA or in Erlang. But the big win here is that Orleans manages all aspects of reliability automatically for you. Um, so I don't have to solve any of these like distributed system problems of like what if a grain dies or what if a whole machine dies, like Orleans framework does it for me. So how does this work? Um, I have eight machines in my cluster. They all have grains that are running and doing things and talking to each other. Um, and then this machine dies because, I don't know, distributed systems. And <laughs> pick your favorite failure method. And, and so all the grains on it died, right? And they may have been processing something or may, they may have just been sitting there idly. Um, but basically, like, now we're in the state where we, like, don't have these things that we were once talking to. What Orleans will do is the next time someone sends a message to those grains that were on the failed machine is it will bring them up on another machine that just happens to have space for them. 
Um, and so the next time like A, B, and C grain are talked to, they will uh, be activated. And as a developer, you didn't write any code. No one got paged. I didn't get woken up. So life is pretty great. And then once the machine comes back up, it'll eventually rejoin the cluster and new grain activations will um, get, will happen on it. It's also worth noting that the single behavior, this behavior happens if a single grain dies for like whatever reason, because it threw an exception or because um, it got deactivated because of garbage collection. Um, Orleans can also actually, and will monitor like hot machines and will start preemptively killing off grains on those hot machines and then they'll get reallocated on different machines. This is another big win um, over or deterministic caching. Okay. So I want to take a moment to talk about isolation. The paper says it has strong isolation. That's that's not really true. Um, it's it's uh, it's it doesn't like totally like claim that it has strong isolation. Just I think the title is strong isolation, so it's a little misleading if you maybe like red skimmed the paper. What's actually happening is Orleans is caught deep copying um, the parameters and the return values before um, before any of those method calls return. And so in that case, you can accidentally modify a parameter value before it gets shipped off box or, or shipped, you know, it could be, the grain could be on the same box, it still gets deep copied. That's why the grains can't mess with each other's state. So it does that for you. It doesn't, however, like isolate you from, like the stack's not isolated, the heaps are not isolated from one another. Um, you can 100% go and spawn a new thread inside of a grain. Don't do that, but you can. Um, you can also go and access some shared memory, advanced maneuver. Um, <laughs> But it's basically, it gives you enough isolation that I, th I, we never ran into problems where people, when they were programming like the model was supposed to be programmed against, where people were shooting themselves in the foot. This just didn't happen. Um, if you buy into this whole thing, like everything is via messages, then it, it, then it works fine. Another thing um, that's been a point of confusion is the messaging guarantees around Orleans. So the paper also kind of says that it has at least once messaging, which is also not true. Um, it's 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 based on the fact that they provide this flag that says, hey, we will retry if a message fails. So like if a timeout happened, then it'll like, you can set this flag that says Orleans will retry the message. However, it's not 100% at least once messaging. So because there's like a finite number of retries, it's also not the default way Orleans is configured and you probably shouldn't configure it that way because it can lead to like a storm of retries and just doesn't do things nicely. Um, and if the grain that was like retrying died, then like all bets are off, right? Um, so basically Orleans is at most once messaging delivery guarantees. If you need to build in stronger consistency than that, you can go do that. Um, and we did for statistics service in Halo because we could not lose messages about stats because people get really mad when like you lose their game stats and it's always the best game they've ever had. Turns out, shocker, I know. Um, and then. The other important thing to note is that uh, there are no ordering guarantees to messages being sent. So if, like in terms of like, oh, I send one message from the screen and then I send another one, if you need there to be an ordering guarantee, then you need to like chain the promises. Um, but they thought about that and then they realized it was also hard <laughs> and made it less available. And so we chose the available route and you don't get ordering in messages. Okay, let's talk about the CAP theorem, AKA why we cannot have nice things. Um, I assume most of y'all know what this is, but this is consistency, availability, partition tolerance, pick two, you do not get to not pick partition tolerance. That's not a thing. CA is not a thing. Just throw that out there. Um, okay, so I've, I've alluded to this, but Orleans is AP. They made the decision, every time there was a trade-off to be made, they chose to be highly available. You can always talk to an actor, you can always instantiate, or a grain can always be instantiated. You will never like get a request back from the services that says like, hey, like we can't talk because like one of our consensus nodes is down and blah, 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 zookeeper died. Um, that's not a thing. So basically what this means for you as a developer using this is that you need to be aware of where it is eventually consistent. The biggest caveat is it's eventually consistent when it comes to grain activation. That would be bad. Um, <laughs> It's eventually consistent when it comes to grain activation. So basically, um, in a normal non-failure mode, Orleans guarantees that there's exactly one instance of a grain running at a given time. And this is generally the mode it runs in. But, right, it's rare, but you need to plan for failure cases. So if you need incredibly consistent data, or uh, it's very important that every message gets delivered to the same grain and processed, or you are like using the grain to pipeline stuff to something else, 
and there might be two of them and that would totally cause havoc in your system. You need to understand this, you need to detect this, and you need to deal with it. We did this in statistics. We did not do it in any other service because we just did not care. Um, and so basically you, yeah. Um, I have another talk that I can point you to where I talk about it. it. There's a lot of things we did. There's tricks you can do like we had immutable data and then we would detect if uh, we had already written this data then we were in an inconsistent state. We would do essentially like um, conditional puts on storage. You use a storage layer's consistency to help you essentially is the way you do this. Um, and I have a couple of blog posts and talks that talk a little bit more about how we did it for statistics because we were incredibly consistent there. We didn't lose data. Um, we did not double count statistics. Everything was like by the book. Um, but basically you can get into this split brain mode so just be aware that this is happening and plan for it if you're going to use this system and like this virtual actorness and then if you don't care, you don't care. Like in presence, we didn't care. Um, so the paper also outlines a bunch of services that were built on top of Orleans. Two of them are from Halo, shocker. And uh, I'm going to talk about those also, shocker, because I wrote them. Um, yeah, I know. Full of surprises today. Um, OK, so we're going to talk about the statistics service. This is sort of like my baby. Um, basically what happened is at the end of every game you would upload, and sometimes during games, you would upload stuff about what you were doing, like events that happened, I killed this person, I like headshotted this person, I hijacked this vehicle from an aerial assault. We had like really detailed analytics about everything you were doing. And then at the end of the game we would process this and store it and like aggregate your total stats and then allow you to basically go on the most fantastic sports center deep dive on our website Halo Waypoint so you could look at all this stuff and the e-gamers love it. And then you can also like, and like normal people like it too, like I like it and I'm bad at Halo, but I don't, there's no screenshots of this because I don't want to show you how bad at Halo I am. Um, but it's cool, right? You can like challenge your friends and like shit talk, it's great. So I am totally, pretend like this is a perfect world because that is a whole nother talk on how we input, introduced uh, reliability into this system. But basically what we did is the game is gonna send a bunch of stats up as you're playing the game. Every game in the Halo ecosystem has a unique ID, um, and so we just instantiated a grain, or we, a game grain was created as soon as you started sending stats, right? It was automatically instantiated by Orleans based on this ID. This game grain deserialized stuff, and it waited till it got a game end event, and then it would merge all of the stats for the whole game, which could have multiple players, and it stored it off to Azure Blob Storage. Um, it would then go and send messages to all of the players in that game to say like, hey, here are the bits of this game that you care about to go update your own personal stats. And so each player in Halo, all 11.6 million of them, um, had their own player grain that would be running based on their unique ID. Um, and then they would process that and they stored that in Azure Table Storage, which is a key value store. Um, what I do not also show here is that if you wanted to get information about the game you had just played, which the game did, or uh, go look at it on, on, on Halo Waypoint or a second screen device, then you would query your player grain and then you would see the stats, it would answer the stats back. So the advantage that this gave us is we basically used our player grains like right through caches and that allowed, gave us really great data locality. So we didn't have to go and like pull all of this data from a bunch of different places onto a different machine. If you would have had a stateless server, you would have to do that or you would have to do some crazy caching strategy which then would have consistency issues of its own. Um, we just use them as right through crash caches and we would detect when you were an in, that I'm not showing here, but we did detect when we were in this inconsistent split brain state and then we would just sort of stop writing and we would re rely on our replay mechanism to catch us up later when we were in a not bad state. But you could always read. The cool thing was you could always read your stats and they may like not show your last game, but that was okay. Okay, the other service that they talk about in the paper is the presence service. This was essentially like our heartbeat data. So every 30 seconds, essentially, the game would tell us what you were doing. Like, I'm on this map and I have this gun and it has this many bullets in it and like I just beat down this person and things like that. The game used it to show you what your friends were doing online. It also used it to show you, um, to allow you to join to your friends' games in progress. Like, is there a space in this game for me to join? Like, the present service would tell you whether that was true or not. And you could go try to join that game. 
this service did not really like didn't persist any state. We really just cared about it being available. We didn't care too much about super consistency because like we got an update every 30 seconds, or sometimes if there was a second screen device connected, we got an update every second. So like being slightly off about it was not really that big of a deal because we just got another message like and dealt with it. So we like literally didn't do anything besides create grains and like hope for the best. And it worked great. It was great. You can 100% do that. Like that's a thing. It's a valid thing to do. Um, so essentially what happened is the Xboxes would send these payloads to these stateless router grains. Um, they're stateless, so Orleans can instantiate a bunch of them at once under the same ID. This is another sort of like nifty thing that we got pushed in because like not every grain needs like to have a state. Um, the reason we had a router grain is because we had to deserialize this payload and we couldn't change the API because it was like 10 years legacy code and it didn't tell us anything about where to actually send it. So we had to deserialize it in the stateless thing. You probably don't have to do this if you get to design your API correctly. Um, there's also like an HTTP server between the Xbox and the grains. We had a front end. This is not like purely RPC from the client, just FYI. Um, so basically the router grain would deserialize it, figure out what the game session you were in was, send this to a game session grain. The game session grain would then like get all the updates for what was going on inside of it. And then it would also send, um, notify the player grains, the players who were in that game, like here's what's happening, right? Like here's what you're doing. So that if someone like your friend asked on Xbox, like looked in your playlist and was like, oh, what is this person doing? We would just hit their player grain in return. And that was fast. Uh, when we had the second screen devices, attached, we ended up with this like observer thing. So another messaging pattern that Orleans supplies, and normally it's request response and you have to wait for the response. There's this idea of an observer pattern that they allow you to implement where you can say like, oh, I care about notifications from you. And then the producer just like pushes updates and does its best effort to send, but it doesn't wait for an acknowledgement. So this is sort of like a nice way to implement certain things. Um, so what we did is when there was a second screen device attached, it would talk to the player green to see what game it was in and then it would enlist with the game that you were in and the game would then push updates to it so that it could see updates from all of the players in the game. And we weren't like, you know, pulling like up to 32 other grains. This was a nice sort of pattern. So that's sort of what happened there. This is also the, um, the service that Orleans was benchmarked against. So the Orleans guys are super rad because they basically would go and benchmark new builds against our code, um, which is awesome because we never got a build that like degraded performance because they'd already benchmarked it because like Sergey and his team are just fucking phenomenal, um, and I love them. So this is like when I get to some graphs and like two slides, this is the service that's like doing stuff. It's doing real work. All of these numbers that I'm going to show you now. Okay. So I'm gonna talk about performance and scalability because this is all like really nice, but like if you aren't a little bit scared about like <laughs> what we just gave up for that, like you probably should be. Um, but the cool thing is, is Orleans's two main goals are to provide a, a nice programming, productive programming environment for developers while not giving up performance and scalability as much as possible. So like they were like really focused on this. So this was a main goal that they spent a lot of time tuning and working on. The coolest thing about Orleans is that it, well, one of the coolest performance things about Orleans is that it runs essentially at 90 to 95% CPU utilization with no instability. So they ran all of these tests where they would just like let 25 big beefy machines go for days and like see what happened and they were all fine it turns out and they ran at 95% CPU utilization which is rad because you get to use all of the box that you just paid a lot of money for. And then I also don't get up at conference and I'm like here's 2% CPU utilization and everyone claps. Um, it's not a thing. Um, I like using the whole box that I pay for because it makes it easier to ask for more boxes. <laughs> um, anyway, so this is great. What also is great is that Orleans basically has near linear scale out. So I'm going to explain what's happening here. This is one of the, 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 the graphs that they explain in the, in the paper. Um, so what they did in this test is they took the Halo Presence service and they had a bunch of different machines and they would basically saturate on throughput and see when it sort of tanked off and start measuring that, right? And then they would add more machines and do it again. And what we saw is basically as we kept, and they kept the number of actors consistent. There was like a million actors in this test. And basically as soon as you added more machines, you got linear throughput increases, which is really awesome when you have to go from like zero to like a whole ton of users that I cannot tell you the exact number of in a day. Because if I can just throw more boxes at the problem, that makes my life a whole lot easier. 
So basically what we saw here is that all of these nodes were running stably at 95 to 97% CPU utilization the entire time. And um, we were processing about 5,200 requests per second per server. This is that Halo present service, right? It's doing real work, it's deserializing things, and it's also doing two network hops. So like this is a real service and it scales linearly, which is fantastic. Um, the other kind of cool thing to note is this is another test that was ran. They basically held the number of machines consistent in this test and they varied the number of actors that they had on those like 25 boxes from 2,000 to 2 million. Um, and then they did throughput tests again. Basically you sort of see it, it maintains, it's pretty steady state until at the end it starts to fall off and that's just because of like um, increased size in uh, the internal data structures inside of our leans. And so if you do start seeing this in production, you can just like add another machine and it fixes itself. Um, so that's also kind of cool that you can get almost like two million, well, like one, one million to two million grains on a box. And this varies obviously depending on what your grains are doing um, without a, having any real like throughput issues or concerns. So you're not like bound by the runtime essentially. Okay, so in conclusion, Virtual actors are really cool. Like even if you aren't gonna use our leans, this is a concept that we can use to start like solving some of the distributed problems in actor frameworks. Um, I've heard since the Orleans paper come out that Akka and Erlang have started to think about like how would we go and at least implement this as a library on top of it so that we can provide some of these niceties. I am not saying that you will never wanna be bare metal hardware and like write crazy C++ code, um, but when if you don't need to be there because you are not at a place that makes sense for you to be there, this is really nice because it solves a lot of the distributed systems problems for you. Not all of your developers have to be like distributed systems like Erlang super hackers and you can like write real code. Um, the other thing that I think is really cool and that people don't talk about a lot in this paper is the AP actor activation. I think we use consensus a whole lot where we don't need to use consensus. Um, and then it bites you in the ass later and you get woken up because like Zookeeper flaked or like something happened or you know, you're not available, right? Like if you're gonna use consensus, you can't be available in certain scenarios and you need to understand that trade off. And we were kind of okay with not being, with not being consistent in a lot of cases because we really just cared about letting people play the game and being mostly right. <laughs> And then finally, like developer productivity. There's no like really good way to measure this, but like anecdotally, we started working with Marlene's when we had about six developers on the services team and we grew that team to 30 plus people in 18 months. During that time, we also rewrote all of the Halo services. There are about eight of them. I talked about two. Um, that was like a massive undertaking and we were able to do it because there was like the core six or so of us who would run around and worked very closely with the Orleans team and like would go debug crazy garbage collection issues and things like that as they came up and like come up with like, well, we need, we have this service that needs to be consistent. Like what do we need to go build on top of that? Solve and think about those harder problems. And we had a lot of developers who could write really great C sharp code who could go and focus on like making the game fun and like iterating with the designers um, and really focusing on the application. And, and you didn't have to have everyone writing Erlang, which was great. Um, and then sort of as a side note of why I really like Orleans, um, I think as an industry we need better tools and frameworks. I think you see a lot of problems happening because people will pick up something that's like easy to use now and it's great to like prototype in, but then like you hit a certain number of users and it's not even that many and like shit just totally hits the fan. Um, and that's sort of not okay, right? Like there's this gap between like developer productivity and and like things that scale well. And we need to sort of close that because we're running into a world where everything is service based and like things are only getting bigger and like problems are only getting harder. And so we need a subset of people to focus on those problems and we need to provide tools and frameworks that allow other people to go focus on the application that they're writing. And hopefully we don't end up in this world where like I built something and then I have to go and spend a year firefighting and rewriting all of it, which is kind of the world that we realistically are in, especially in Silicon Valley right now. Um, so that's sort of my little rant about that. I'm not gonna name names. Um, and then if you want to go, the cool thing is this thing is now open sourced on GitHub, which as of like mid-January, which like is, makes me so incredibly happy because this was like a labor of love and something that took a lot more time and effort than it should have been because it's just really cool and the community has been excited about it for a really long time. It's up on GitHub, you can go read the code, you can go contribute to the code and fix issues. They're actively developing this because Halo 5 is going to also be shipping on the, sh the 
the services that we built, which will have new Orleans features, like they just released their streaming API. So that's pretty cool. And that's all I got. So do you guys have questions? Do it. Hi. Um, first, this is really cool. And uh, I remember first time seeing Erlang, and I, was, I couldn't sleep for, for a week. <laughs> this was when I uh, uh, debugging multi-threaded uh, code and crap like that. And, uh, so, so this is cool. Uh, my question is, now there is a trend to come to kind of uh, microservices architecture where everything is kind of small and disconnected and you build a system uh, made from small ones. Mm -hmm. This is, you can say that the, 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 uh, this model kind of resonates with that, but, uh, but it's still, it's a one big silo exe uh, that, uh, uh, that runs all your code Mm -hmm. Some little change, you know, someone wants to make a little change. Now you have to ship the entire service, the entire multiple services. Mm -hmm. So how, how, uh, how, how does it work with, the, with that trend or if it works? Yeah, so we actually had like eight distinct services running in Halo. So you can like that we're all running Orleans code. So you can have your micro or SOA or I don't want to say something that Kelly Summers is going to get mad at me when she watches this later and yell at me about. Um, so I shouldn't say microservices. But... You can do SOA, right, and isolate the components that need to be isolated. We generally did that around like system and application level constraints. So like presence was its own thing because it didn't need to store data. It only cared about being super like um, available. And like stats is its own thing because that thing had to be real particular about what data it stored. And, and we started to break things down even more when it made sense to do that. Um, at the end of the, like we put HTTP servers in front of ours, right? We had a really, really lightweight server that we just wrote in house because IIS was too slow. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, like versioning is not something that's super solved in this. Like you can, we, they are working on it. Like I actually had a really great conversation with Sergey, who's like the lead developer on this before I moved down here in December about different ways that we think about doing this. And you can do it in a couple ways, right? Like you could do it now out of the box by implementing a serial, like using a different serializer. So like, there's a serialization format in an IDL that is called Bond that just got open sourced. Um, I know a lot about it, but I'm not allowed to say why. Um, and so you can infer whatever you want from that. Um, but you can go and like shove that into Orleans as the deserializer, and it's a binary format, so it's really fast. And it's like, you know, tolerant, like it's sort of like Protobus, but for C sharp and C. And I think it also now compiles down to Linux. Um, and that way you could have like small changes in your, in your data structures, what's coming over the wire and shove it into there. Um, and then they're also working on a better versioning story of like how when you deploy new grains, like can we pick those up on the fly and not have to redeploy the whole system? Um, like if I deploy a new method, is that okay? It, this is like sort of the eternal trade-off, right? Of like, do I wanna send up a whole nother server and talk HTTP to it, which is kind of slow? Um, or do I wanna use RPC within the service because that's fast? And generally within the data center, you probably want to use RPC because it's way faster, especially if you already have an open TCP pipe. <laughs> Jeff would like me to say HTTP2. <laughs> What's up, Kyle? Hey, how you doing? Um, when, you, when you rehydrate a grain, uh, it's possible that there could have been prior instantiations of the grain, prior activations, which ran concurrently and were not aware of each other, right? Like maybe they're separated from partition or a yeah. failure. Do you get the chance to combine the state from all previous concurrent instantiations so that you could not drop messages to a grain? Like imagine a grain got Oh, like you mean if it process, it did process the message and it acknowledged that it processed the message, but I had two of them running at the same time. Right, so yeah. you got two copies of the grain state, which, yeah. which could be merged, is that possible? So you could, you have to write that code yourself. What's um, the storage layer? Pardon? What's the storage layer? Is there blob It's storage? whatever you would like to use. Um, Azure actually, so I should mention Orleans right now has a dependency on Azure table for some of its like internal state stuff. I think there is also a, a currently a current GitHub open issue to make it like a interface and then you can plug in whatever you want if you don't happen to want to be on Azure's cloud. But we were on Azure so that was 100% fine. Um, like, so you could do that right on activation or you could detect and say like, like in, in stats, essentially everything was sets. So like we just like merged sets um, when we got into a better state and then your total stats were correct, right? Um, and then everything else was just like an entry in the set. 
Cool. Thank you. Um, we didn't, but like that was also because most of our services were fairly finely tuned to do one or two specific things like in, in a row. Um, and we also did a ton of performance and scale testing, so I'm sure at some point we had something that was doing something really stupid and then we fixed it. Um, one thing to, that is worth pointing out when it comes to like resource allocation is that this thing will run into garbage collection issues in .NET and will cause, and GC stalls just kill it. Um, silos will like show up as debt because there was like a 15 second GC pause. So we had to do a lot of, I know a lot about how the CLR dot or garbage collector works at this point because we went optimized around making that G2 collection as fast as possible. Another cool thing that actually came out in like uh, server, win server 2012 or whatever is there's a dot net 4.5 garbage collector that's for the server and it won't pause on G2 collection. So like obviously you're giving up some memory there, like it's not always available, but you are also not, it's not gonna pause the world type thing, which is better. We didn't ship on that, but we have since moved to that because when that became available, it was like a month before we shipped and we were all really scared of taking a whole new garbage collector. Um, you kind of could, but basically like we ran these on like extra large machines, so I think we had 16 cores, and so you have 16 threads working. So even if one is hogging a thread, it's not going to starve all the rest of them. This isn't something that's like single threaded at its core, so that like if one thing goes off, like no one else gets to do work. Like the other like 15 cores will be, threads will be running, and like people can do work on those. Um, there's no isolation, it's just the Orleans scheduler. So like Orleans will manage however many threads versus like number of cores you have in a box, it'll make that many threads and then it'll like do work in these grains in turns. And so they have their own scheduler, um, but they don't do anything to say like, hey, you don't get to like, like it won't kick you off of a thread. There's nothing that does that level of like multi-tenancy because ideally you are within the same service. It's not meant to be ran in a multi-tenant environment. Uh, hey, um, so you used just the number zero as the grain identifier in your example. Yeah. Can you only use numbers as grain identifiers, or can you use arbitrary objects, or? You can use longs and GUIDs. Okay. Uh, and so are you, do you just have a monotonically increasing number of virtual grains out there? Or uh, how, how, I mean, are, if you're just spawning new things for each user, like yeah. is there a, a fixed trade-off there? They, they never actually get... Uh, like the 80 bytes, whatever associated with it, never actually gets deleted, correct? Yeah, it will. So like uh, the DHT does, like the way the, the DHT and the caching works is like when a grain gets deactivated, it'll also send a message to all the caches and to its entrance in the DHT to remove it. Because it has to know that it's not there to know to go activate it the next time. So like sometimes those don't always work and then you like might go to a machine because your cache is there and then it's not there and then you go back to the main DHT and that might take an extra hop. Um, but that works. The way we did, so like basically on activation, like I wasn't, not, I wasn't assigning a new ID every time, like if you come online, right, like you have one ID that identifies you every single time you come online and that's actually assigned by Xbox Live. And then the game ID thing was, we had a bunch of those, like there's 1.5 billion of those in existence as of like June 2013, so there's like way more than that now, I just don't have a public number I can share with you. Um, and so Orleans actually goes and like will clear out its cache and will clear out its DHT. So it's not like, oh, you start like leaking memory over time. So when it's cl uh, garbage collected, then it's not persisted anywhere? It's just completely forgotten about? Yeah. Oh, and, okay. And so what it's doing is then the next time it comes in, it looks at the DHT and it's not anywhere. And so it's like, oh, I need to, the hosting system is like, cool, I need to go make this somewhere. All right, thanks. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, so I was wondering if, if you could comment on kind of the tech transfer process between like the development team within Microsoft and MSR, because I know that they had been, at least like I interned there millennia ago, and, and they, they spent a lot of time kind of wringing their hands about how to do tech transfer. And so I was kind of curious as to what like that process was like kind of from a development perspective and like what the interaction with the research team looked like. Sure. 
So we found these guys, I think, because of the paper they published, and I can't remember if it's because of like a tech fest or something. But anyway, we just like set up a meeting with them, and we're like, hey, we want to talk to you about this thing that you're building. We think it's really interesting. It sounds cool. We want to use this. Um, this is like not normal path Microsoft things, I should also point out. Um, and we were also in Kirkland. Our studio had its own space in Kirkland while they were in Redmond. Um, and so basically, but basically these guys were great. They were like, yeah, like come learn about this. They sent up a whole day thing to like walk us through and help us understand what was going on. Um, and then we got kicked out of Maine studio and had to go live in Redmond for a summer. I call it summer camp 2011 because we ran out of space. Um, and then we got to go back eventually, but it was actually really advantageous because it happened at the time where we were essentially like on in a building really close to them. And so we pair programmed with them, like Gabby and Sergey and like Jorgen all came over and like dealt with stuff and like dealt with me pulling my hair out and understanding what the hell was going on um, and figuring all of this out. And then they were in our daily standups through launch. Um, one of them would call in. Like I said, they were running performance builds like nightly against our code. Like that's pretty deep interaction. Um, they were taking feedback, like a lot of the things that are in there, like reentrant grains, observability pattern, um, immutable data, which I didn't even talk about. Like if you want to get rid of that deep copy because you know, like you're saying, I promise I will not touch this data, you can say that and then it won't copy it. And that like gives you a performance gain. These are all like sort of advanced maneuvers that we needed to make the system highly performant. And you can actually use all of them. And those were things that came from the developer team um, that we sort of like push back and some of it's like some of us wrote code that's in Orleans from that team and some of it was we made a request and worked with one of their guys to do it. And was was a lot of that prior to the first paper's publication or was that like between the first and the second or? It, so, let me get back to that slide to get the dates right. So the first paper was published in November of 2010. Um, we started working with them in the summer of 2011, so like June or July, and then they had this, this, the second one was in the works. So that I believe was the one that we like started like reviewing off of, and then um, and then they were with us all the way through launch, which was 18 months. And we also did a test run where we replaced one of the existing Halo services, like Halo Reach, which was another game that had launched a couple years ago. We we built the present service and replaced it in production with this Orleans Azure one. And that's where we found some of like, um, we found a memory leak and we found a bunch of other things, but like they're not in the system anymore because they worked very closely with us to like analyze like, you know, like memory dumps and like figure out what the hell was going on there. Um, obviously they weren't on call for it and that's totally fine. Um, not better about that. Um, and <laughs> I'm kidding, I love you, Sergey. Um, and, but it was like it was pretty much like the coolest partnership I've seen at Microsoft or like you know anywhere in industry, um, and they're they're now still working very very closely with the Halo team to ship Halo Five and add new features there. Thanks. Hey. Hey. Um, good talk. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, as I assume when you're playing Halo, like it's got to exchange a whole lot of messages when you're firing at people or whatever it is people do. Um, does that go through Orleans as well, or can you talk a little bit about how that's done? Yeah, not currently. So um, when you're playing like a multiplayer game where you have really high latency sensitivity, because like if I shoot a bullet at you, you want to react to that. Like 100 milliseconds is a lot. Like dodge um, it. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, sorry, Australia, um, because. I feel bad for Australia. This is like a problem because they always get match made in, like with the US people and it's just bad. Um, but anyway, that's actually all done via the consoles um, over like whatever Xbox's like protocol is. It's XDP, it's something special. Um, and there's a lot of magic happening there that I don't fully understand. The biggest issue there is that we were actually deployed in one data center. And so um, you, you couldn't host dedicated servers using Orleans right now. Um, there is an initiative inside of Microsoft that's in existence now called Thunderhead, and this is the ability for game developers to spin up machines on demand in Azure and data centers across the world that can act like dedicated servers for your game. And so because Azure has enough data centers across the world, you can always generally find one that's close enough to the people that are going to be playing to start doing some cool things there. Um, and no one that I know of when I left was using Orleans with that. I know it was something that was talked about because it's like the next sort of like iteration of it. Um, games have shipped using it, but the, the, the big challenge there was to solve like how do we co-locate 
data centers to people. And then the next challenge there is how do we, which Sergey and his team are also thinking about is like, how do we, what does this look like in a multi data center environment, right? Like, what do grain, like, activations, like, if you, like, you aren't moving that much, especially if you design it around people, but like, what does that look like to have activations that are across, like, one activation across multiple data centers, right? Or strive for that. Cool. Thanks. Cool. So one of the biggest problems with the Erlang runtime that I run into is uh, HOL between multiple actors messaging between uh, servers. Uh -huh. uh, how was that dealt with? And were things like RDMA over converged Ethernet looked into? Because Azure's published a lot of papers on that. So I'm not super familiar with Erlang, so I don't know what HOL stands for. Uh, Half-life blocking. Half-life blocking. So you mean like you can end up in a deadlock? Uh, Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so there is a trick called reentrant that you can tag grains with, and it means that the whole grain can have multiple messages being processed at the same time inside of that. Um, and so if you have things that are like kind of stateless or you don't care so much about having messages interleaved because you're not, basically if you're not persisting a lot of state or not modifying state, then like inside of the grain on message processing, like if you're just doing a read, that's fine. Um, so the reentrant tag got added. So we use that in a lot of our stateless workers. So you can have a bunch of messages going through there at the same time. Essentially, this is like one of the limiting factors of the system is that you are bottlenecked on like a, a grain could back up message processing if you go and do something really expensive, which is why we say don't retry because if retries continually fail, like no more messages can get into the grain. It's better for your application to go and retry later, right? Also, I want to point out that the queues are bounded. Um, the messaging queues inside, the in-memory queues on our leans are bounded. It's configurably bounded, so you can decide what tolerance you would like. Uh, hi, I'm kind of curious about one of the benchmarks that you showed. Uh -huh. um, can you show the, the graph of um, nodes versus throughput? This one, no, this one. Yes? Uh, the, the previous one, sorry. This one. Uh, right, yes, yeah, so you're doing about, what is that, about 5,000 messages per node per second? 50, yeah, we had 5,200 requests per second per node. 5,000 or 50,000? 50, yeah, 5,000. 5,000, right. Did you ever try to measure like the overhead of that versus just actual RPC or sockets? Because it seems like that's actually not that great of a throughput. It's not, but it's doing real work there. Um, it's deserializing. Like if you could get that number very, very high if you ran an artificial benchmark that was like ping this number would be way higher. Uh -huh. um, this is doing like a very heavy bit of computationally intensive serialization and then, or deserialization, sorry, of that like payload that was coming up from the game, which is not, which is fairly large, and then also doing two hops and then like coming back. Um, so like you could make this number a lot more impressive if you went and scaled the benchmark to make it look more impressive. The, the main goal here is to show that this thing scales linearly regardless of the amount of work it, it's doing. Sure. And yes, you could get a higher number bare metal than you ever could on Orleans, but then you have to go write all the code yourself. Sure. I, I was also kind of curious if you found, um, with a location transparent API, did you find programmers like trying, I mean, I, I feel like the first thing, once you give someone a location transparent API, one of the first things they try and do is try to hack around that and try to co-locate, you know, computation and data and, and you know, try to optimize for that. Is that something that you guys found a need for or was it not really a big problem in practice? We talked about co-location of grains a lot because in theory, and we, but we didn't end up implementing it. So there is this idea that like if we're in a game together, if we were on the same box, hey, wouldn't it be great because then I don't incur like a network hop to process this. At the end of the day, the latencies we were, we were seeing were fine. Um, if you were going to go and implement a dedicated server like in Thunderhead using Orleans, you might want to try doing co-location. This is something that's possible in the runtime. They just haven't um, gone and done it yet because it's not something we needed. Um, and then from like our developers using it, because of how the programming model is set up to look like you're just literally programming against functions, I think it... We never ran into this issue where people were like, oh, but I need to know where this is and I like want to go and like extract the IP because A, you can't get it. There's no way for you to get it. 
and B, like it looks like you're just programming against a, a library, right? You're programming against an interface and it looks like normal programming. So you don't even, I don't even, I mean, I always was cognizant of the fact that we were going off box, but that's because I was involved from the beginning. It would be interesting to like talk to some of the early developers when we on ramp them and we're like, hey, like go write this function. Like if they even thought about the fact that like when they were invoking this method that it was going off box or if it was just like invoking a method because it's not actually exposed to you. And so that's, that's good and bad, right? Like you need people to think about that when you're designing things, but you also like want people to just focus on the features they're writing and write really great features as well. Thanks. And no one spawned threads because I threatened them. Um, <laughs> Another, another one? Yeah. Um, real world uh, experience, uh, how, how much, you, you were talking about isolation and kind of did like that. So uh, the question is uh, how, how fragile is it? Meaning some stupid developers doing stupid stuff and, and locking the entire uh, silo, uh, spawning threads outside the, or in the regular .NET thread pool or doing some, I, I, have, I have no idea because we didn't do it, right? It's like one of those things when you adopt the system, you say we're not going to do these two things. And by not do two things, I mean not do one and a half things because we didn't spawn threads, but we did use shared memory for one very specific instance and we had a very long talk about doing it. Um, it made sense for what we were doing. It, in terms of like, oh, if I'm just like programming against the model as normal and not spawning threads, you're never going to have the problem. You're using a third-party library that's using, I don't know, task uh, parallel yeah. library. You're using third-party library that's doing uh, 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 non-async calls. So <coughs> shit happens. So how fragile yeah. it was? Um, it, I mean, we didn't have a problem with it, right? Like, we always made a cognizant effort with, like, all of our storage and anything that was going outside of the Orleans ecosystem was using an async library. So that's, like, number one, don't block the thread because it'll just sit there. Um, so you need to use async libraries. You need to be aware of that when you're picking up third-party stuff. Um, even if it does spawn another thread, like the real issue there is as long as it's not touching any of the actor state, which like a third probably library is not going to, you're probably okay. It just might like do non-asynchronous things and therefore like consume a thread and you might see some degraded performance everywhere else. Um, but there is, you know, I mean there is no like heat isolation, so it's, it, it's good and bad, right? Like, We did not have a, yeah, we didn't have a problem with it, is basically what I'm saying. Yeah. So um, one quick question to start. Uh, so when you do multi-hop uh, requests, uh -huh. do you block, or what was the kind of the encouraged programming model? Did you have a promise that you keep the actor? I mean, it gets tricky when, you're, when you have the actor model, but you have to wait for other actors to respond. So how did you deal with that? So you cannot actually block if you're just programming against actor messages, because everything's forced to be async via the compiler at compile time, right? Like if you're chalking to multiple actors, all of those messages are async. async. So you have promises to them, so you actually can't block. You could block if like, for instance, you were programming to store to storage, and that storage library didn't have an async lib, then in theory you could block that thread, right? Sure. Um, but don't, don't do that. So, so we this... use chaining of promises, we use sequential parallelization of promises, we use fire off a bunch of promises and let one come back and then like take the first one. Um, all of those things were used. Cool. So this graph is using the promises then? Yes. This okay. is all, all promise right. based. And, then, and, then the and no th storage. There's no storage writing. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Um, then the second question is in terms of, I know, I know the paper basically just says we don't handle multi-actor multi operations. Yeah. But I imagine especially in sort of interactive or sort of rich user experiences in Halo, let's say we got transfer items or something. There are going to be certain use cases where I want that. So is that something that you ran into ever with the developers? Is it something that's kind of on the roadmap for Orleans? It seems very useful to be able to, sort, I mean, this comes down to the locality question as well maybe, but you know, did you ever want transactions or is that something that's, that's interesting? Yeah, so transactions is interesting, right? And I'm thinking you're getting, I don't know if you've read the original papers that talk about this. Um, we did for stats, right? Like, so for statistics, if I had transactions, that would be super. Um, we didn't. We were essentially able to sort of like use sets and do a fairly good job, like do a good job there. Um, we basically just had to rely on a storage mechanism to provide consistency when we needed it, and that was okay. And I think, like, I, I remember when we first looked at the paper and we saw all this transaction stuff, like the, in the like first and second paper. And it seemed like really compelling. And it also seemed like a really, really, really hard problem to solve, especially at the general case. And so 
And it also starts bordering on, like, did we beat the cap theorem? A little bit when you read it. And, um, and so we wanted something that would, like, always be responsive because that was, like, the number one thing. Like, our services were not allowed to say no ever, especially because of our legacy API. Because if it said no once, like, then, like, it just hung out. Um, <laughs> It's, it wasn't that bad. It would like try again eventually later, but it was like not super, our clients were not super tolerant to us failing ever. So if we gave you stale data, that was better than us giving you no data. Great, awesome answers, thank you. And great talk. So you said uh, you not, when you uh, send multiple messages, you don't block, uh, but once you chain back the promises from uh, multiple actors, right? You're still processing the single message mm -hmm. on one task. So you, you can't process the new one until mm -hmm. you get the response from all the multiple actors. So you, in, in a sense, you are just waiting for, uh, until you process one message, which can take more time. Yes, so you are not blocking the thread, but you are blocking doing anything else inside of that grade. Sure. It, right, but it's like, generally when we say block, we mean block a thread. Like other things in the system are processing and doing stuff, so that's good for throughput, yeah. but you, right, like you, most of our, I think most of our operations only talk to like one other grain, or like two other grains, or like, I mean like in terms of like chained hops. Um, in, we, in fan out, we sometimes talk to like 32, and then would take the answers from like anyone who responded and return that. Okay. All right, I think this is going to be the last question. And then there's a bar. Are you coming to the bar? Yeah. OK, so there's going to be a bar. So if you have more questions after this one, uh, just follow us. And then you can ask things of, you can ask Katie more things. But uh, you get the last one. Thank you. Um, so Orleans is a uh, distributed systems tool for ordinary developers. Uh, can you speak to its, uh, I mean, that's what it said in the paper. Uh, yeah. Can you speak to its use at other teams um, at Microsoft? or it's used yeah. in other teams at Microsoft, thank you. So I'm gonna talk about the one that I know is public because I don't wanna get in trouble. Um, so in the paper they talk about Galactic Rain, which was this phone game um, where you basically went and fought space battles and then they would render on the server the conclusion of these battles because it was asynchronous gaming. And so once like you made your move, it's like words with friends, right? Like once you made your move, the server would be notified. Yeah. Can I amend my question? Yeah. Um, is it used on any teams or services that are not like game or specifically locality based? Um, not that I'm aware of inside of Microsoft. I know since, so Orleans has been open as like a, I forget what, exactly what they call it, for a beta essentially since March where you could download the binaries and play with it. And I was in Sweden talking about this and there was actually a fair amount of people over there who had been playing with it and implementing systems that I don't know how into production they went because we weren't giving the full like, hey, we support you Microsoft guarantee. So people are really, like, I mean, it's fair. Like you don't wanna pick up something that's like maybe not gonna be supported because the future of it was unclear. Um, there were a lot of people who did talk to me from outside of Microsoft, from like consulting companies who were like, hey, this would be a great use, especially for like internet of things or stuff like that where you have all of these like aggregators and um, stuff that's communicating very frequently. Um, so they were very excited about the idea of this potentially going open source. Um, so I can probably maybe answer that question better after London and Budapest where I'm speaking about Orleans and some other Halo things and hopefully people will tell me about the cool stuff that they're doing. All right, thank you, Katie. Cool. Like applause for Katie. Woo!